What's up, everybody? It's Johnny King, another episode of the Becoming Kings podcast. And I have the privilege uh, of having Rich Ababoto all the way from Luxembourg. What's up, man? Thanks for joining us. Hey, Johnny, how are you? Super well pronounced. It's uh, not an easy surname to pronounce. Also, you'll get intimidated. So, so well done. <laughs> it sounds, uh, it's almost, it rolls off the tongue. What's, what's the oh, origin wow. of, your, of your last name? So both my parents are from the Philippines, but it's not a very typically uh, Filipino name. Filipino. Um, yeah, it's, um, it's the Philippines used to be a Spanish colony. So a lot of the names are kind of, you know, Spanish derivatives like uh, Domingo, Gomez, Sanchez, those kind of names. So Abab I don't know where Ababoto comes from. It's a bit, uh, it's a bit random. So for me, it almost sounds like uh, African, Nigerian. Yeah. Ababoto. Yeah. yeah, Ababoto. I like it though. I like it. Very, very cool. We, we connected through the good old Tony Robbins uh, network, so to speak, right? Um, and what I love about Rich already just having some conversations with you is just that, uh, again, you, you kind of embody a lot of my message too. And it's kind of, you know, we share it with the work that you're doing also. It's just like, man, you, you can accomplish a lot in life. And yet if you're not fulfilled, um, what's it all for? So finding that balance between, uh, you know, success, if you will, monetary success, achieving things in life, building your kingdom while still making sure that you're enjoying your life. Right. So, Absolutely. um, I think it's pretty cool though. If, if I'm looking, you know, as I'm looking through your bio and, and just hearing from when you told me offline, it's, it's pretty cool. You, you flew with the Royal air force, correct? That's right. Yeah. Yeah. So tell, tell, yeah. Tell the listeners and the viewers a little bit more about what you did and how that, you know, how you served over in Iraq and Afghanistan and how, where you went, you pivoted from there to something completely different. And then when you went from there to what you're doing now, tell, tell a little bit more of just your backstory, if you will. Sure. So I, I served, as you say, I served for uh, 10 plus years in the UK Royal Air Force. Um, I was a pilot um, flying tornado GR4s. So that it's pretty similar to the F-14 Tomcat out of uh, Top Gun. Actually, it's a, it's a twin seat um, fighter bomber. Uh, the difference is that the Tomcat can take off and land from aircraft carriers, whereas a tornado cannot. Um, so it's that kind of era of aircraft. I had a Wizzo, we call them navigators, you call them Wizzos. Mm. Um, yes, and I did two tours in Iraq um, and uh, one ground tour in Afghanistan. Um, so that was kind of the, the peak of my, uh, my military career back in kind of 2006, 2007. Mm. Yeah. What's the difference between the, the two tours, a ground tour, you said, and then, so you were flying and you weren't flying between those two tours. Yeah. So t the, both the Iraqi tours were, were, uh, flying tours. Yeah. Um, Afghanistan was a ground tour. So I was, I was, uh, seconded to the British army. Mm -hmm. Um, and one of the kind of lessons identified post the first Iraq war was that the Air Force and the Army and the Navy very much operate in silos. Mm. So they weren't really on the battlefield. Their communication was not optimized. Mm. Uh, and obviously, worst case scenario, you get blue on blue, right? You get uh, friendlies killing friendlies by accident. Mm -hmm. So one of the lessons identified post the Iraq war um, the first one was, okay, we need to better integrate the three forces. Mm -hmm. And how do we do that? So they're in their wisdom, they got pilots to work with the army. They got tank drivers to work with the air force. They got, you know, submariners and Navy guys to, to, to work in the various services. So I was, um, seconded to the British army for two years. Mm. Um, and we went to Afghanistan. We actually took over from the Americans, uh, it was 2006. So it's the first time um, non-American troops were in charge of Afghanistan. And um, I was part of the British Army uh, headquarters and force that went out. So I did a ground tour, yeah. Mm, fascinating. Well, uh, rewind a little bit. What had you always wanted to get into it? Have you always had a love for flying? Was it watching Top Gun? What, what was it that got you kind of spurred into going into that before we even talk about you know, where life went after the Air Force. Tell a little bit more about your, your childhood, if you don't mind. Yeah, no, absolutely. And um, it, Top Gun certainly was a big influence. I'm not sure how many times I watched the movie, but that yeah. was that was definitely an influence. 
Um, I watched that movie over and over again. I was very Same proud man. to show it to my my two boys, my ten and eight year old boys. Yeah. Um, I was surprised how much swearing there is, and I'd forgotten actually. <laughs> show it to <laughs> yeah. a ten year old, yeah. eight year old. Oh, oh. Your, your mom's, um, yeah, yeah, exactly. And the uh, and the sex scene as well. The uh, yeah. yeah. Um, but no, I remember when I was um, probably around about ten, eleven, twelve. I watched a program and it was basically advertising being an airline pilot. Mm. And it said, I remember the, 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 the phrase was 10 seconds um, before takeoff, you, sorry, you, you take off the plane, 10 seconds after takeoff, you press autopilot. You then sit there for uh, however long, just monitoring the systems. 10 seconds before landing, you turn off the autopilot, you land the plane and then you're somewhere tropical, beautiful, warm. <laughs> You spend two or three days in the hotel pool or, you know, traveling with your crew, with the, uh, the other pilots and the hostesses, and you only work half the month and you get paid a decent salary and you get to travel the world. And I was like, that's my job. That sounds like a fantastic <laughs> job. And um, a bit like now, the airline industry was in a tough place, right? Um, so they were not recruiting. So I kind of got... Um, pushed into going to university. I had no desire to go to university. Um, but the um, my head of sixth form at the time was saying, listen, just go to university and the industry will probably be in a better place in three years and then you can apply. I said, okay, fine. Um, and when I got into university, there was a thing called the University Air Squadron. So it's like a club affiliated to the Royal Air Force. Mm -hmm. And it was 20 pence for a shot of vodka or 20, you know, 20 cents for a shot of vodka and free flying lessons. And I was like, as a student, that's a pretty good deal. Yeah. Uh, obviously, we didn't mix the the drinking and the flying together, but for a student to have fairly cheap booze and free flying lessons, I was like, this is this is brilliant. Dream come true. Yeah. Yeah. So I got into the university air squadron, um, and I thought, you know what? I can always be an airline pilot afterwards, and I can be a fast jet pilot first. But you can't do it the other way around. Mm. You can't do an airline career and at 40, 50, go and fly fast jet. So I was like, right. cool, I'll go and fly the fastest, pointiest aircraft on the planet, um, live, live my Top Gun dream, and then, and then I joined the airline. So, that, so mm. that's kind of where it originated from. I also remember my father taking me to an air show when I was about seven, going, wow, planes, cool, this is Same. really fun. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah, exactly right. So yeah, so much. And I've been dying to see the second Top Gun come out, obviously with COVID. I guess it comes out later on this year maybe I it's, think it's due to yeah it's due to yeah yeah fingers, absolutely yeah. fingers crossed which you know by the way to, to you know tangent just to see tom cruise still fly you know planes at his age and like the dude you know it takes a lot of just athleticism i don't know what else to, to call it but yeah yeah, yeah. It's, it's it's pretty cool it's just fascinating to me again and i hear so many people whether they're olympians or they they get a dream they see something it sticks in their head from when they're six seven eight nine ten same with you and it it carries you through your through your career to some extent yeah you know? and and another thing i'd add i remember in my bedroom there was a poster and i think i got it from a careers fair or 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 maybe an air show, but I remember it vividly. It was a picture of a tornado. It was over the sea and it just said, where do you want to spend the best years of your life? Mm. Royal Air Force. Mm. And you know, with Tony, Tony Robbins and the power of questions, uh, if I only now is that, do I appreciate that it was a question it was asking me, right? Where do you want to spend the best years of your life? Mm -hmm. And I was like, there in that, in that plane, in that cockpit. And yeah, uh, yeah the, the air show influence, the Top Gun influence, and this 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 program I watched about being an airline pilot all kind of added up to me wanting to be in aviation. Yeah. What was that training experience like? Was it uh, I got to imagine very arduous and intense and um, just a lot of time, obviously in the cockpit. What tell a little bit more of what that was like? I'm just fascinated to hear. Yeah, and you know when you know when things happen so long ago, it feels like a dream, Johnny. Yeah, like, yeah. yeah. So, so sometimes when I look back, I was like, did I really do that? But yes, it was, it was fairly arduous, and there were times where there were many times where I wasn't sure I could do it. Um, it's four years of flying training um, with about four or five different aircraft. Every time you fly, you like in a 
I'm guessing enough, in a 120 hour course, you could probably screw up one flight once. Mm. But once you once you fail a trip, like, you know, the microscope is on you straight away. So you fail the trip again, you're kind of chopped, you're, you're out. So they don't have a lot of time to, you know, you need to produce the goods fairly quickly. Mm. Um, you get show. Yeah, exactly. There's a lot of pressure. I mean, they spend they spend four million pounds on each fast jet pilot to to get them through training in terms of, uh, you know, the investment. So quite rightly, they want to make sure that they're investing their money in the right place. Mm. So I think my original class of 12, I think three or four of us got through to to the very end. Um, But it's almost like every day is a driving test. I don't know about you, but when I did my driving test, my knees, were, I could, they were uncontrollably shaking when I was 17. Yeah. Just do my simple driving test. Yeah. But every day when you get in an aircraft is, is like every day is a chop ride. We used to say a chop ride is when you get chopped and you're cut. Mm-hmm. Every trip is potentially a chop ride. So, you, you know, a lot of it's psych- psychology. And, and I remember telling myself before I kind of got really into the kind of personal development space, I, I call myself just, just saying, I can do this, I can do it, I can do it, I can do it. Just to almost drown out the, oh my God, you're gonna screw this up. Just to drown out that other noise, I can do it, I can do it, I can do it. And I used to record some of the um, exercises and, uh, and some of the key facts I needed to learn. I used to record them onto a cassette. That's obviously how old I am. Yep. And I, w- I would go to sleep sometimes playing the cassette because I thought maybe if this can go in subconsciously, I can save some time. Like, and now I, I'm, I'm learning about you know, affirmations and the subconscious mind and, and all those things. I'm like, oh, wow, I was kind of onto it. I, was, I wasn't far off the mark. So oh. yeah. Not far yeah. at all. Well, that's, and that's kind of your, your leading into what I wanted to get into, which is like, what, what were some of those character development, if you will, or, uh, you know, yeah, building lessons, if you will, about uh, just you as a man, you as an individual, your sense of maybe uh, self-esteem and yeah, just, just who you are now. What, what, did, what were some of the, the bigger things that you took away from that experience, just being a fighter pilot and being in the, the Air Force? I think one of the big things is that when you're really thrown into something, you have to produce. When you're like when you're in close formation with another aircraft, like two feet apart, and all you're doing is, you know, doing your best to move the throttle, move the stick and the rudder and I'm staring at this plane in thick cloud and we're being thrown around I'm not I'm trying to get close enough so I don't lose him but not so not so close that I hit him and then you have that kind of thought which is like I really can't screw up here you almost don't have time to be afraid because you're like if I even give an ounce to my fear we might die or I'll fa- or I'll fail the trip so, so very often, certainly in the military, because you, you get shown something once, you do it, and then you're kind of qualified. You know, that's quite crude in a crude way, but most often, more often than not, that's that's the way it is. Yeah. Um, I mean, I had a single engine failure over northern Iraq in 2006, and that was the scariest moment of my life because it was, I don't know if you remember, but it was, there was a town called Fallujah in northern Iraq and three Americans were hung off a bridge and it was broadcast all over Al Jazeera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and of course, the Americans went ballistic and they were like, you know, heavy artillery into the town of Fallujah for about, I can't remember what it was, a number of days. Um, and we were flying over Northern Iraq and cut a long story short, we had an engine problem. We'd been flying for six hours. We we're about to refuel for the third time. So I'm low on fuel. And there's a, there's a problem with the engine. I need to shut down the engine, which is a huge problem for the tornado because of the way it takes fuel from different parts of the aircraft. So I now have a fuel imbalance. I could have a, a catastrophic engine failure, which would mean we'd have to eject. If we have to eject over Fallujah two weeks after what's just happened, we are like HVT, we're high value targets. Yeah. So all this was going through in my mind. If I'm on the ground, I'm gonna be on the run. They're gonna be after me. Uh, I just didn't have time to be afraid, although 
if I hadn't, you know, a nanosecond to think about it, I would have been really, really scared. Yeah. And it was an emergency. We declared emergency. It's like 45 minutes. We had to drop the bomb, but we had to drop the bomb safe because you can't land with one engine and a bomb and a fuel imbalance and all sorts of stuff were going on. I had like five people talking to me all at the same time because you're declaring you declare a made you declare a mayday in effectively a war zone. Yeah. So all the bells go off. But I think to answer your question is you just when you're really put in those kind of situations, you don't have time to be fearful. Mm. You just, I mean, you just do stuff and training certainly kicks in. Um, but I think, uh, I think having faith that, you know, when, when the proverbial shit hits the fan, you will produce the goods mm -hmm. because you have to, mm -hmm. like, there's no choice. You don't even have the time to think about it. You just right. do it. Right. Yeah. And yeah, there's something to be said about how important uh, repetition is, you know, yep. so that muscle memory just takes over when shit hits the fan, right? Absolutely, set, yeah. Right? absolutely, yeah. So we would go into the simulator, practice emergency drills every month. Yeah, yeah, repetition mm -hmm. is definitely key. And we would do a lot of, uh, which now I can, I can kind of um, cross the dots, um, so to speak, but like a lot of time we would visualize stuff like you know the like you got the blue angels in america right and uh what's the other the air force um i can't remember the other name but we have, so we have the red arrows but their sequence i i remember the you know the 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 pilots would actually visualize whether it's in the bath or sat at home so they would just shut their eyes and they'd visualize all the commands they would give how the aircraft would move what they would see you know, their, their inputs into the throttle and the stick and that whole visualization really helped. I guess it's their subconscious, right? And it's, we, you know, we learn it in personal development, like visualizing your goals, imagining the goals actually happening. So, which ties into your rep point about repetition. Yep, yeah, yep, absolutely. Yep. Well, and I can, I can also hear all the guys that are listening to this podcast in the future screaming at me. To, they want to know what happened. Close the loop with the, the single engine uh failure what what happened how did you get out of that you drop the bomb and when you drop the bomb is it actually active or can you turn off the bomb so it just drops and it's just dead weight no so it's a, you, it's a dead weight yeah. yeah yeah so like if i was to take a backup so you can only refuel a tornado kind of three times after that you don't know if the oil is going to evaporate and and you can't you can't obviously cannot replenish oil mm. um airborne so we, we, we were tanking for the third time. All, everyone's pretty tired. It's, it's almost kind of dusk. And all of a sudden these attention getters start going off and like loud, loud alarms going off in my head. I looked down, it said the right hand engine was vibrating beyond limits. Mm. So it's not designed to vibrate that much. And if it continues, it could just explode. Mm. So you, you throttle back. And immediately as we throttle back, we start to lose the leader and the tanker. Mm -hmm. So, you know, repetition um, is the mother of all skill. And I, I immediately went into the drills, which is right hand throttle idle uh, and see if the warning goes out. Um, we can't maintain flying speed. I can't actually fly on one engine in the desert that high. So I'm actually starting to descend as well. And I've got no fuel. I declare an emergency. So the boss drops down from the tanker. We change leads because he was the lead. So I had to it was more easier for me to be the lead and him to formate on me. As we descend, my navigator starts reaming through the emergency checklist in the back. I'm talking to him. I'm telling the boss what's going on. I've declared emergency. I've got to tell the ground control what's happening. As we descend, of course, there's a dust storm. So I can't, we can't see. Um, and then we have to find somewhere safe to drop the bomb. Um, dropping the bomb safe has another checklist. So we're running two separate checklists. Uh, and all the same time, I'm trying, there are about 12, I've forgotten now, I think there are about 12 fuel pumps in a tornado. And I've basically got to keep switching different pumps on and off just to push fuel to the correct part of the aircraft so that we don't have an imbalance. Because if we've got an imbalance, then when you come to land, one wing might just drop. Or if you've got a forward and back imbalance, the nose could drop or the tail could drop. And you're the first time you're going to know is when you're close to the ground. Yeah. So in the end, we dropped the bomb in the lake. We found a lake um, and there was actually a uh, luckily for us, there was a, um, a, a, a old Iraqi Air Force base that had been taken over by the US Marines. 
So 45 minutes later, we landed in um, on this um, Iraqi airfield. And I was very happy to see lots of uh, smartly dressed US Marine Corps uh, ground crew giving us very punchy salutes. Uh, we spent a week there. And uh, I remember watching um, Team America. Yeah. And uh, is it was it Napoleon? Can't remember the guy. Napoleon Dynamite. Yeah, Napoleon Dynamite. So yeah. I was sat there with some US Marine Corps watching some DVDs. And <laughs> that was when I was introduced to Team America and Napoleon Dynamite. So all, all Yeah. So you made it out, obviously. You made it out, yeah. Yeah, you made it out. But then you were stuck essentially for a week while they're fixing your plane or just stuck trying to for, arrange? Getting... Yeah, stuck, stuck for a week. Um, um, a transport aircraft had to fly in a new engine. They fitted the engine a week later and then we fl flew her back uh, back to Crazy. Qatar. Crazy, yeah. crazy. Yeah. So you had a little bit of a, a week-long vacation, staycation on the base. Yeah, yeah. 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 exactly. Oh, man, that's, that's harrowing. That, that'll make you... Like you said, you don't even have time to see your life flash before your eyes. You were just all, all glued to the procedures, right? Yeah. yeah. See, I think that's important too, though, because I, I talk about with uh, a bunch of the guys that I work with, like an emergency action plan, whom I, I got that idea from my Tony Robbins coach years ago when I was doing Platt. And he was like, when again, when she hits the fan and you go into your, you're just starting to spiral, you know, using kind of the same analogy, it's like, you have to be able to pull yourself out of this, you know? Um, and it kind of reminds me of Top Gun when he goes into that, you know, uncontrolled spin, you know, yeah. how do you, yeah. how do you get out of that? So I, I'm sure we could spend an entire podcast talking about your experiences with the Royal Air Force, but it's just, it's cool. It's fascinating. I, I, like I said, I grew up with jets all the way around my room on wallpaper and, you know, posters of, you know, various jets. And yeah, I was, I think just because of watching Top Gun primarily. So kind of cool. Well, let's, uh, let's jump forward a little bit. You, you ultimately moved out of the, the Air Force, right? And you started getting into investment banking. Yeah, Lucia? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, there you are. No, yeah. Um, and so what, uh, were you just, you were done, you, you did your time and you were moving forward? Was it, what, what attracted you to go from, you know, flying a fighter jet to then wanting to get into investment banking and then tell, tell the listeners about your first day and how crazy that was. <laughs> so what I know now is that being in the Air Force was no longer filling my six human needs. I, I didn't know that at the time. The way I kind of framed it at the time was that if I stay in the Air Force, there's kind of a little bit more upside. You know, I might fly for the Red Arrows, I might fly the Typhoon, but I'm probably going to continue going on operations I'm probably going to continue going on cool exercises, but I've kind of done all that. So for me, there was not that much more growth. Mm -hmm. And I thought if I stay, I will be 38 and then I'll go into the airlines. But I was like, I don't want to do that now. Mm -hmm. For me at the time, it was like going to the airlines was like driving a bus. Yeah. And I was like, now I've done this. I don't want to, I don't want to be an airline pilot. What else can I do? And actually I can change my careers easier when I'm 30 than when I'm 38. And I had a maths degree as an undergrad. And I remember it was like a super mega bull market, right? So Financial Times, you know, markets were going crazy. And, uh, you know, Financial Times always saying, you know, these traders, multi-million pound bonuses. And I was like, hey, I, I, could, I could do that. <laughs> um, so I, I went to do a master's in finance at London Business School mm. to make the transition to finance. I thought it'd be useful having a a, uh, a recognized qualification and there are 160 people on the course average had seven years of finance experience i had zero mm. um there were three others there was a pianist a lawyer and i can't remember the other person but there were four of us who had zero experience i was the first one to get a job with lehman brothers but i was wow. also the first one to lose a job when uh, when i the, the, day, the day i joined they went bankrupt so unbelievable yeah so i remember walking in um on the monday morning actually the sunday night looking at the uh the bloomberg articles because we knew what was happening you know obviously it, it, it'd been months that the share price was going down and down and down and the weekend there's going to be some big news we didn't know what that news was sunday night before i go to the office um bank of america headline bank of america buys and i was expecting it to say lehman it says buys merrill lynch i was like 
Next article, Lehman Brothers declares bankruptcy. I was like, oh man. So I went in the next day um, to a very surreal environment. You know, uh, people had lost millions that day, right? Because, and I know there wasn't much sympathy for bankers. I, I get that. But some people had come from other banks, taken their multi-million pound bonuses from, let's say, Deutsche or Goldman. They'd come to work at Lehman and they'd gone to yeah. zero. Mm. So here was me thinking, ah, how am I going to get a job in an industry where there's tons of qualified people hitting the street and I've got no experience. But the reality was people had lost a lot on that day. Mm -hmm. um, but it was it was very surreal and, and fun to look back at it now. Obviously, it wasn't fun at the time. Why, why do you say it's fun to look back at it now just that you got through it and <laughs> yeah, I got got through it. And I you know, I was in banking for 10 years. So I figured uh, if I could get through 10 years in investment banking, and there's a tough 10 years for investment banking, and I joined with zero experience, and I joined at the start of the global financial crisis, yeah. then, then so who cares about a, a global pandemic and people having to pivot? I, I, can, I can figure it out. So, mm -hmm. yeah. It's just interesting. Again, you, you, you know, there's a, a pattern here, obviously, with your, with your life, with your life experiences, your career where you're learning some pretty massive learning lessons from, from each chapter. You know, we talked about what you learned from, from flying. What were some of the biggest lessons that you took away from 10 years or more of investment banking? Um, good question. I, I guess the biggest thing I took away from investment banking is that <laughs> And you know we're kind of told this repeatedly, but I think you kind of have to figure it out yourself. Is that money? Money doesn't buy you happiness. Mm -hmm. um, and I remember from my military career, I would have done that job for free. Mm. You know, put put a roof over my head and give me food. I'll do this job for free, day in, day out. And then banking was like, I've never earned so much money in my life, but get me the f out of here. Mm. Like, yeah. Mm. Um, so even though we kind of know that message, I think, I think individually we need to kind of figure it out or even taste it for ourselves before you actually, you know, there's only so much you can read it and tell, like I could tell my children, no, money doesn't buy you happiness. They're like, yeah, yeah, sure. Papa. Yeah. We, yeah, we get it. But until you feel it. Totally. It's, it's hard to, to really connect with it until you have, <laughs> like I said, all of the means, all of the success, science of achievement. And you realize I'd give it all up just to be happy, just to, to love what I do, to, to be excited when I get out of bed. Right. Yeah. Uh, and yeah. I think people find themselves in that type of work environment. They find themselves in that type of relationship. You know, uh, they find themselves in that type of health. Oh, if I could, I would do anything to lose 60 pounds. You know, we find ourselves stuck because we're, there, there's a payoff sometimes to, to these things and, and it's such an allure you know, and maybe, maybe it is that, like we were talking about six human needs of, of certainty of having money, but then the significance that comes with, you know, flashing certain things or having a certain job. Right. But what, what was it that ultimately drove you? I mean, I, I kind of, kind of know the answer to my question, but yeah. Talk about how that career then ended and what you're up to now and Tony Robbins and personal development and that whole transition in your life. Yeah, so so for those that aren't really kind of aware of Tony Robbins' work, I went to one of his early events um, called uh, Unleash the Power Within, UPW. Um, so it's in London, there's like 13,000 people in the arena. <laughs> and it's a four day event. After day one, you end up walking over like hot coals of fire. Um, and it's an amazing event. Uh, but the, one of the things that I remember to this day was him talking about the six human needs. Um, and without going into too much detail, explaining what, I, and I, I kind of discovered then why I'd been chasing certain things subconsciously and it wasn't providing happiness. It wasn't providing fulfillment. Um, and then the solution was like, okay, I just need to chase growth, not chase, but I need to focus more on growth and, and contribution. Otherwise I, I'm never going to be fulfilled. So that was the kind of the eureka moment. And I took away from that, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna leave investment banking and focus on something else that's involving more growth and helping other people. And so it finished on a Sunday. 
Um, and on Monday morning, all the meetings were cancelled uh, back at back at the back at the bank. Um, and it transpired that over the weekend, uh, a colleague of mine had committed suicide, and he was um, he was the youngest managing director I think in recent history. So he was obviously doing well, fast track, super nice guy. Not one of these people that whenever you walk past him, he's always smiling and comes to greet you. So not someone that had any attitude. Um, and he, he'd left, uh, you know, he, he'd left behind a one year old daughter. So I, I had, I still have young children now, but I had, I had, uh, you know, my kids were probably kind of six and four uh, at the time. And I was like, I was like, what, you know, wow. Of course, it was super tragic. Like, no one could believe it happened. But to think that things were so bad that the easier the easier option was to take your own life, for me was was like so powerful. And I was like, this so underlines that I I need to get out of an industry which I feel for me is toxic. Like, you know, when I joined, it wasn't like that. When I joined, it's full of growth, lots of significance, lots of certainty, lots of variety. But then it no longer served me like Richard Aboboto. Um, and, and that was a huge, very powerful message for me, which was, okay, I need to really focus on being fulfilled, making it work without being such a slave to earning more and more and more. Cause it's not going to, it's not going to, it's not going to lead to any kind of fulfillment. So that was like the real watershed moment. Um, and of course, like most people who are thinking about a career change, they're worried about, well, I've got bills to pay. Um, I'm on a really good salary. I'm going to risk that to go to zero. Uh, and, you know, we all get accustomed to a particular lifestyle, whether it's holidays, car, home, etc. So for the next two years, I, I definitely had those kind of concerns and those worries. Um, and then I went to another Tony Robbins event, Date With Destiny. Um, and from that, I was like, okay, I want to get into coaching. I want to get into personal development. Um, and there were a series of events which kind of worked in my favor. One of them was Brexit. My wife works for a financial institution in London. Brexit happened, so they had to find an office outside of London. So we moved out of London into Luxembourg. Um, and that was a great opportunity for me just to resign. Mm. Um, so it took two years to eventually get to the stage where I left. Um, and I did go to zero, you know, I was earning a six figures, six figure salary. And then I went to zero, um, which I think is hugely kind of liberating. Yeah, it's scary. Of course, it's scary. Yeah. Um, but in a way, it's quite liberating. It's like Elon Musk, who we're well, not quite the same, but I think didn't he live? Didn't he uh, live off like a dollar or something per day yeah. for like 30 days? Yeah. And then when he knew he could survive, he had no fear. He said, well, it doesn't matter if I lose my money go bankrupt I can I can survive on a dollar a day yeah. so you kind of banish those fears um but yeah so now I'm, I'm an executive coach here in Luxembourg and you know I'm aiming to help those people who are kind of like me and my old colleague avoid burnout right and mm. help them have fulfillment as well as success find that balance right yeah that passion yeah yeah absolutely well, I, uh, that's why I'm excited to kind of get into this part of the conversation, just because uh, myself included, I mean, I think a lot of guys have gone through experiences of that, um, more more guys than not, who, man, they've, you know, they, they look and on paper, they, sh they feel they should be happier than they are, right? And they've got so many things, they've worked hard, and yet there's just this sense of emptiness, or like you said, burnout, there's the frustration, there's, there's numbness, then they find themselves you know, um, yeah, numbing or distracting themselves through some type of um, addictive behavior, whether it be watching TV or porn or gambling or drinking, right? And so in the work that you do with, with, uh, with individuals, what's some of the first steps that you, you do to help identify, you know, <laughs> whether it makes sense to because it took you two years to move on. Like, how, how do you help them kind of move and whether it's the right thought to jump ship and find another completely different career? Is it something where they can actually, you know, make lemonade out of lemons and, and do well where they're at? How do you help them start to assess their current situation? 
Yeah, so I, th I think one of the main things about coaching is that it gives the individual the space to communicate what's uh, what you know what their underlying feelings are. And I know as guys, we don't you know we the guys talk about his feelings. Maybe now it's more kind of acceptable, a bit more modern, etc. But you know, like the suicide rates across males, right, speaks for itself, right? That, and, and and you know, one of the reasons that's that's um, those high numbers are attributed that way is because we don't talk, right? Guys talk less. Not only do we speak the, the fewer absolute words in a total day compared to a woman, but we just don't talk with each other. Right. It's not. It's a sign of weakness if I was to tell you, Johnny, I'm feeling sad today, or you know, I've got this on my mind. So we we keep a lot in, which doesn't help, right? Our, our minds just kind of loop problems. And you get into a vicious cycle where you're just focusing on stuff that's not working. So I think the first stage is is giving that individual, whether it's male or female, the space, mm -hmm. the space to talk, to communicate, um, and, and and more often than not, put stuff on paper. Because firstly, we don't speak our problems. Second thing, when you when you write them down, it's a bit more clear. Um, but nothing that I do is is telling the individual what to do uh, you know i think it's nlp where one of the foundations is the you know the answers are within you so my job is just to kind of tease out through asking um powerful questions mm -hmm. that the client he or, or or herself answers so it's it's not about me telling them what i think they should do it's more about me facilitating that discussion because they they know themselves way way better than I know themselves. You know they know their their situation, their scenario so much better than I than I ever will. Right. Ever ever. So who am I to tell them what to do? My my, my job is to facilitate um, and to help them discover themselves. But the interesting thing about that, I imagine, is that yes, they know themselves so well, but then they also have this deeply intimate relationship with their limiting beliefs with yeah. their you know uh scotomas their blind spots with all of their yeah. things that hold them back so because you're not actually emotionally attached to those things i feel like i imagine don't let me put words in your mouth but i imagine you're you're able to you know shed light on some of those things to ask certain questions that get them to realize oh i didn't realize this was right behind me in my blind spot which allows them to move forward yes Yes, exactly, exactly. You know, and like, uh, sounds cheesy, but a, a jar can't read its own label, right? So uh, you, you can pick up on stuff a lot more easier than, than they can and say, oh, that's interesting you say that. Is that, is that true? Is that necessarily true? Is that a belief? Let, let's analyze that for a bit, yeah. So, mm -hmm. and maybe you'd be a bit weird if you did that to yourself. <laughs> if you're able to coach yourself and go, hey, yeah, that's, that's interesting, I thought that, but, um, but no, maybe, maybe some people can. I, I, I find myself doing that, you know, at times oh, and, and it's, um, you know, Byron Katie's work. I don't know if you've heard of I've her. Heard, I've, I haven't read her work, but I know the name. Yeah. You know, he, Tony, I, I, I had learned about her stuff before, but he kind of spoke about some of her stuff at, uh, the relationship program okay. through platinum, um, at, in Maui when I went and it's her, she's got like a, four fundamental questions and one of those questions is do you know that to be absolutely true yeah you know and yeah. there's kind of a turnaround process and so it's just following the book and i've memorized you know the questions i can ultimately coach myself and catch myself sometimes like sometimes i get very you know i know this this is the way you know especially if i'm having some kind of argument with you know a significant other or a friend or a family member then i have to catch myself like honestly johnny do i actually know that that's true no I really actually don't know for sure. Mm, and that helps yeah. humble me a little bit to be like, you know, then don't be so much on my high horse, you know? Yes. So I do. Yeah. And I feel like that's, that's the key is ultimately for you, for me, for those that we work with to, to do the same thing that you did when you were having your issue over Iraq or wherever that was to where like, whether they have you or not as their navigator behind them that they've gone through enough of the repetition and there's training there that when they, the shit does hit the fan that they're able to, to pull out of their, you know, spin, if you will, by asking the right questions, mm. you know? Mm. So I do yeah. feel like that's, that's a big part of, you know, 
the, the coaching industry in, in general, which I think is pretty, pretty powerful. So yeah. how are you, how are you drawing? Um, I mean, again, there's probably so many different ways that you can answer this question, but drawing from your past experience of whether it be flying or investment banking or anything even before that as a childhood uh, sports relationships, how are you drawing various things to, I guess, to be able to support your clients in a way. And, and does it, well, let me ask you this too. Does on top of that, does it come from your education through Tony and various other aspects? Are you really focusing a lot on the six human needs to help them move forward? Or do you have your own kind of framework from which you, you coach from? Yeah. So I, I did my coaching training with, uh, with strategic intervention, which, um, as you know, is the uh, Tony Robbins Madonna's kind of uh, coaching institute. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, a lot of the stuff I naturally lean on um, comes from uh, Tony Robbins and, and Chloe Madonna's. Um, no, six human needs is, is only only one of the things that we, we kind of touch on, but it's very kind of client specific. So depending upon what they they need, it's very bespoke to them. Um, um, and is there's a, there's such a thing as like recency bias, right? So I think I think a lot of the stuff I talk about is stuff that I've learned recently mm. through through my own coaching with other clients, through any kind of recent training I've done. I'm looking at doing the NLP stuff fairly soon. Um, ultimately, whatever works for the client, and I, I I guess subconsciously I take some of my experience from the military. And, and and maybe and certainly from banking actually from banking because that helps me empathize with them you know i'm not sure how many coaches there are that have actually been a trader uh for for an investment bank sales trader marketing director so i, I can really empathize with the pressures that they face mm -hmm. uh, and the whole environment um so yeah i guess it is a bit of a mix yeah mm. i think that's uh i think that is what helps make you human you know as a coach and and relatable um because a lot of what you've talked about just having the the courage to make those career transitions those, i know for me it's like super scary but then once you go through one and realize you didn't die you know everything worked out it allows you to have more faith in being able to pivot which seems like you i mean you've done some major pivots um and to talk about being in a class of let's say 12 fighter pilots you end up being the top three or four and just saying, I can do this. I can do this. I can do this. Or having no financial investment experience, you know, and being in a room of, you know, however many, um, it's just interesting to see how you could have easily chosen a story that debilitated you and robbed you of motivation and drive. And yet you've been able to kind of work through that, which I think is pretty unique because I feel like a lot of people definitely hold on to their stories of limitation right yeah but do, yeah do you do, do you do much work in terms of with your clients just focusing on their stories that they've created about themselves yeah no definitely like story and state right so there's a i don't know if you read his book or if you've come across him john doran boss um so he was a nfl player for 14 years and i think the average for uh, an nfl career is about three or four years yeah yeah but he was um amazing story he presented at, uh, I think it was Business Mastery. And he, um, when he was 12, his father murdered his mother uh. in the, um, quite, a, quite a violent murder. Um, and, you know, he became the boy whose dad killed his mum, right? So the whole book was about, you know, changing your story. And that could have been his story. Like, just like you say, it could have been his story. He could have been the guy that was always labeled as the guy whose father killed his mother. Um, he he got heavily into magic because it was kind of an escapism. Mm -hmm. So he's always carrying a 52 card uh, deck of cards and he got, got really good at magic and then went into NFL 14 year career, had a um, out of the blue heart condition, which basically meant he had to stop straight away. Oh, geez. Um, he then became a finalist on America's Got Talent doing magic. You can YouTube his videos, actually. He does some pretty cool stuff with Simon Cowell. Crazy. And I just, it's such a, a beautiful human being. And it's such a great example of, you know, choose your story. And he says that several times in the book, you know, choose your story or, you know, change your story, change your life. Mm -hmm. um, 
but you know as you kind of pointed out earlier on we're all we're all human beings and i catch myself with a story sometimes right mm -hmm. and i say no whoa, 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 where, where, where did that come from you just stop telling yourself a story so it's really interesting from a growth perspective um, and seeing it in yourself and seeing that you know we're all liable to to take the wrong step every now and then but it's it's having that awareness first and then kind of bringing yourself back to where you know you need to be mm -hmm. let's uh again kind of coming back to to your life's experience you've had multiple stories <laughs> multiple acts if you can if you will in in what you've already lived but through that would you say that there's a a theme or what's what's the story of the journey that you've been on personally I think the story, the, the, the theme for me is, and it, it's going to sound a little bit cheesy, but you know, really, if you if you put your mind to something, you can really achieve anything. Mm -hmm. um, and I, you know, I have to tell myself that over and over again. I'm, as you know, I'm I'm I, I'm an executive coach. I'm starting out a new business, but it, you know, periodically I have my own doubts. I, you know, and I've got to actually remember, no, no, if I put my mind to something, I can achieve it. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of quietening that other voice that is, will always be there mm -hmm. and almost like taking it with a bit of a smile. So, oh, hello, it's you again. Um, no, it's cool. I'm, I'm going to manage this. Thank you very much. But I appreciate that you're telling me I can't do it. So, mm -hmm. yeah, it's just about mindset, I think, you know, um, and, and having that open mind um, constantly. And uh, whether you call it a beginner's mind or an open mind or, or a growth mindset, but just having the mindset, because what's the alternative? The alternative is um, things that are going to disempower you. Mm -hmm. Right. So but a lot of people say oh, it's positive thinking BS. Well, is it? I mean, that's how you could reframe it. But another way to look at it is like if you're the alternative is far worse. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, I, I, I completely agree from the standpoint of I think about, well, and there's times that I agree, I have that voice in my head and I think to myself, like, I, I don't think I can do this, you know, or I'm not qualified to do this or, you know, that, that sort of thing. But then I really do play out like, okay, if I follow the, the advice of this, this voice, where's it going to take me, you know, versus what's potentially possible. And what's to me more exciting? What's like, if I'm looking at the adventure of my life, like what direction do I want to go? And, you know, something that I can, I can pretty much tell you for sure that if I go down that hole of not believing myself, you know, there's going to be a, a, a life of missed opportunity. Um, Absolutely. Absolutely. Whereas yeah. in like what, what, the sky's the limit if you believe in yourself, but it just, it does take, and that's why I feel like, uh, guys that are listening to this potentially having a coach such as yourself, who's who's walked the talk, you know, and is in your corner in the same way that like you're, you're having that, that engine failure. If you had, if you were trying to do the pumps while also doing the checklist, while doing like, there's something to the fact of someone having your back, you know, mm. <laughs> being able to communicate, being able to have, being in relationship with men. But I feel like a lot of times men find themselves in silos where they feel like they have to do things by themselves. And, and like you said, without like, don't talk, just do. Well, no mm. wonder guys, you know, the, the suicide rates are so high because guys don't talk and, but they do take action, you know, but rather than ending things, look at uh, maybe doing things different than how you've done it in the past, which would be to reach out to you, right? Ask for help <laughs> uh, and see what type of expertise or new ideas they can glean from your coaching, right? So in that how would guys get in touch with you? How can they learn more about you? How can they, uh, if they're called to and resonate with your story, how can they kind of move forward with you a little bit? Yeah, absolutely. So I've got a website, which I, I think I need to rename because it's too long winded, but it's strategiccareercoaching.co.uk. Um, you can look me up on LinkedIn, uh, Rich Ababoto. I'm not sure. Hopefully you can see my name on the screen. Um, yeah, it's, those are the kind of two main ways uh, cool. getting on the websites. I mean, I got I give you my number as well. I'll put it on the comments. It's uh, plus four four because it's UK plus four four seven eight two four eight one one eight eight three. But even if you don't use a coach, you know, I, I think it's really important to have that conversation with other guys or girls that yeah. you trust. Yeah. Um, just get that dialogue going and. 
Now, it might it might feel uncomfortable at the time, but um, it, it's really the way forward. Yeah, I I completely agree. Um, and yeah, I, I I like it. Strategic Career Coaching Co. Uk. Right. Yeah. Um, they can find you there, and they can just sign up for a little coaching call, correct? Yeah, exactly. So I offer a, a free one hour clarity coaching call mm. um, to see if it's right for, for the individual and if it's right from a, from a coaching perspective. So yeah, free, a free hour clarity coaching call. Yeah, that's um, pretty cool. Yeah. Pretty powerful, pretty powerful. Uh, in, in wrapping, what is it that, that lights you up or inspires you? It's still, it's, well, it's still aviation actually. Is it? Yeah. Um, well, no, say, saying that, um, I, I, you know, saying that, like being part of this Platt community, which, which you're fully aware of, um, I, I, we came back from a trip in Costa Rica, um, and it's so hard to put into words, but it was just a tri the trip of a lifetime, meeting some really beautiful, amazing people. Um, and I, I came away thinking, oh, wow, I didn't realize such kind human beings existed. Mm. 44 years of being on this planet, I was like, wow, these people are just amazing. They're beautiful, they're, they're lovely, they're, they're kind and generous beyond words. And there, there are a couple of incidents that happened. I was like, that would never happen. I, that, that's just insane. Um, so yeah, that, 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 that really lights me up. And this whole kind of personal development space as, as you know, in the last kind of five years has just been amazing. It's just been an amazing journey. I know it's not for everyone. And, and there's some people who are kind of like super hot to it. And some people are kind of warm to cold. Um, we, you know, we've all got our own journey. We're all, we're all individuals, we're all different, but it's just been amazing. I, I've loved every minute of it, what I'm learning um about myself as well as as well as processes and other people it's just fantastic okay. another thing that lights me up is flying um tiger moths so i'm in a team where we fly nine nine aircraft in formation in the uk so if anyone is interested in vintage flying no in an open cockpit aircraft made of oh, wow. canvas and string with <laughs> then is that right I, yeah, yeah, I yeah i don't even know i don't even know what type of you said a tiger or what yeah it's called a tiger moth so it's like a basically a biplane, so two wings, yep. no, no cockpit. It was designed in the 1930s. Wow. And it's a very old plane. And we fly nine of them at air shows doing various formation displays, like, like the Blue Angels, but uh, going at like 60 kilometers an hour. Yeah, yeah. That's, <laughs> very, that's very amazing. Slow. It's, uh, are the, inside those planes, is there much equipment or is it just, it's like how it was back in 1930s. It's Pretty much. We, yeah, we've got some mod cons, but it, it's so old that there were no radios at the time. So the way that the student would communicate with the instructor in the back was a tube. It was just a hose <laughs> with, with a funnel that you would shout down uh, a rubber that's hose. That's crazy. Yeah. Wow. Wow. It's really old. It's really old. That's, that's really, really cool. Well, I definitely want to, next time uh, I'm over in the the uk or in over in europe i'll have to come see absolutely you. that's really absolutely cool. yeah well rich thank you so much for uh just sharing your wealth of knowledge with with the listeners and viewers um i really think that guys uh you know if you're listening to this and, and you resonate with rich and his experience whether you feel like you're just struggling with being exhausted every single day and feeling like you're not optimizing your time you know or, or you're really struggling even just to manage your emotions um and it's leaking if you will from your just ability to maximize your performance i think uh reaching out and at least having a conversation with rich would be totally worth your time so uh rich thank you really really appreciate you and, thanks johnny yeah man it's been we'll, a pleasure uh, yes likewise we're going to keep in touch of course um since we're on the the personal development uh, journey and if I can do anything more to support you I, I definitely will because we need more guys like you and uh, yeah thank you I really appreciate it thanks Johnny thanks for having me on your show absolutely absolutely thanks guys thanks for always uh, tuning in listening to the Becoming Kings podcast until we meet you on the next episode uh, we'll check in with you soon take care <laughs>